why did we pick this topic? It's actually quite a timely topic because, you know, after COVID-19, a lot of people thought the Chinese economy was going to rebound and go back to the original growth, but that hasn't materialized. And it's interesting for a while there, I thought, well, gee, everything says it's going to be slowed down and then a different event happens and so forth. And so it become, it's become rather a hot topic because it's not one where everyone agrees that the answer is, you know, it's permanently slow or whatever. So we thought this would be a great topic for us to talk about uh, because it's not so clear what the right answer is. And we're very fortunate to have three leading experts uh, on Asia and on China with us. Uh, one remotely, uh, Dan Rosen, who got called away to give a speech in Europe, and so he's virtual. Uh, but with, then we have uh, Steve Roche uh, at Yale and uh, Shan Jin Wei. But the other is, this is a three-way debate which is highly unusual. So Dan is going to take the position that is permanent. Shan Jin is going to take the position that it's temporary. And Steve is going to take the position that it depends. So it's going to be very, very interesting because we're going to have two on one rebuts and so forth. It's going to make it pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. So before we start, though, I just want to explain uh, what the order of how we're going to do this debate. Each of our debaters will have two minutes to answer the following question is, why do you personally think this is an important topic? And I think that will help to set the stage. Then we're going to go for a sh short period into a traditional debate format. So each of them is going to make an opening statement. They have four minutes to basically put their best foot forward and explain why their view is the right and proper view of this question. Then the unusual part will be the rebuttal phase. First, we'll start with Dan being rebutted by these two gentlemen here. So Dan will have to listen as each one of them takes two minutes and makes their arguments as to why they think Dan's arguments are really not valid. And then Chan Jin, who will then be rebutted by Dan and by Steve. And in the end, uh, Steve will be rebutted by Dan and Chan Jin. And it's going to be very interesting, but it's uh, unusual to have a three-way debate with rebuttals. Then we're gonna slip back to the traditional ending. So each one will have four minutes to give a closing statement. And then you're, then you're gonna to get to vote what your view is, having listened to, to each of the debaters. It'll be very interesting to see whether there's a change in opinion. And then you're all gonna to get to vote who the best debater is. By the way, the best debater should be independent of what your view is, right? So if the best debater is someone who took a position that you don't believe in, but they just did a great job, then you should vote them the best debater. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A at the end. So we're gonna start out with Dan. Dan is uh, somewhere in Europe, right? <laughs> Where are you in Europe, Dan? Hi, Peter, and I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm in Paris this evening. Uh, but we do have, I guess, some slides on the background of each. Maybe we can go through that. There we go. So Steve Roach is a senior fellow at Yale Law School of the Paul Tsai China Center, but he is a real veteran. In fact, he was the Morgan Stanley's head of Asia for many years and very highly respected. And uh, I, I lost count the number of times I've heard you speak, but uh, they've all been very, very insightful. Oh, my. <laughs> the next is Dan Rosen. Dan, I've known for what, 25 years, maybe something like that, right? Something Probably like since it. I looked like a, a, that picture, which is yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. But uh, Dan is partner and co-founder of the Rhodium Group. Mm -hmm. And those, those of you who are somehow involved with China know that they do a lot of things, but they are one of the premier firms in terms of uh, giving advice about China, but also tracking data on uh, capital inflows, et cetera. And then the last is we have Jin Wei, who is a professor at Columbia Business School and also SIPA. Uh, where my wife was, was Dean. He is a known expert on China and these matters over here. So we have three you know, wonderful uh, experts uh, on this topic. So Dan, we're gonna start out. Two minutes, why is this topic? Oh, yeah. Are they taking the poll? Oh, so, oh, uh, oh, let's do the poll, I'm sorry, that's right. So let's do the poll. I'm glad you're here, okay. So now the way we do the poll is there's a QR code up there. So if everyone can, and those of you who are online, if you can do the same.
Oh, vote for permanent decline, right? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if this day is Shangjin, you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> yeah. Where's the votes? You should, you should vote for permanent decline now. <laughs> <laughs> No, Shangjin, you want it low now, so you that want, if it yeah, goes yeah. higher, you that's want why I should vote for permanent decline now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not right. <laughs> permanent decline now. <laughs> You've got it's nothing but downside. So do we think do we think we've gotten everyone? Yeah, let's start this thing. You should vote for permanent decline now and temporary decline later. <laughs> okay, I think it's not moving around, which means Either people have fallen asleep or we have the results. So there we have it. So that's the opinion of, uh, of the group. Remember those numbers. We're going to see how people feel at the end. So let's get started, Dan. Uh, so why is this two minutes? Why is this topic important? Thank you, Peter. And it's really great to be part of, um, uh, of this program together uh, with my good friend, Shang Jin uh, Wei and Steve Roach and, and you, Peter. Um, look, this, this topic is, it's really the most important question in the world among economists right now, because the seeming um, uh, bulletproof nature of China's growth in the past uh, had profoundly changed what economists thought about the economic development process in recent years. Developing countries had uh, ceased to think that they had to make the kind of hard choices about taking on debt and capital that the, le the previous lessons of development had underscored. And even in the advanced economies, uh, there has come to be a very strong temptation to embrace some of China's industrial policy designs uh, uh, on the belief that uh, there weren't as many negative consequences to that sort of statism as uh, we had um, uh, believed there to be. Uh, until pretty recently. And so the whole question um, of what the lessons, the economic lessons of the 20th century in the contest between liberal market economics and, and statism uh, was reopened uh, and up for grabs. And hence uh, the debate now about the nature of this extraordinary slowdown that we've seen take place in China this year um, is uh, tremendously important to policymakers and thus tremendously important to me and my colleagues at Rhodium, given our role uh, speaking to uh, senior officials and, and business leaders around the world. Thank you. Wow, you did it in, in one minute and 40 seconds, so that's great. Okay, so Max, uh, Shangjin. Good evening, everyone, uh, or good morning, if you happen to be uh, uh, in Asia from uh, on Zoom. So why is this topic important? Uh, very simply, 20% of mankind lives uh, in uh, China. So a bit faster or slower growth rate means a bit faster or slower improvement in living standards of, for 20% of mankind. That's a very big deal. Number one and number two, for the rest of you, uh, you know, you probably have relatives in China or you invest in China, or even if you don't do any of those, uh, your uh, pension fund, your savings indirectly are linked to uh, the prosperity uh, of uh, uh, Chinese economy uh, uh, and uh, uh, all the other uh, economies uh, through uh, supply chains have very strong connection with uh, Chinese economy. So therefore, a stronger or weaker growth uh, uh, of China also matters uh, for the world uh, economy in a very genuine sense. The Chinese uh, economy has been a growth uh, engine for the world economy uh, for the last 20 some years. That's Great. why it's important. Wonderful. And last, Steve. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. Um, why am I here? I would just tick off three reasons. One, um, I'm here to debate Dan Rosen, and I love debating <laughs> Dan for years, and I find out he's not here. And he's, he's come up with some lame excuse. Um, he claims he's in Paris. I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I believe that. Uh, secondly, I'm here um, for what Shenzhen just alluded to. <laughs> what, are you speaking in French now, Dan? No, I just um, held up my room key for my hotel here. Okay. The yeah. I would be small, so just as proof. Uh, China accounted for 30% of global growth since the global financial crisis. So 
without China, the world economy, as Shenzhen just said, is, is in trouble. And I worry about that. The third reason, Peter, is um, a deep personal reason. Uh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm sort of lost. I'm in search of who I am uh, as a person. For 25 years, I was bullish on China uh, and um, uh, probably the most bullish economist on Wall Street. And then a year ago, I threw in the towel for a lot of reasons that are similar to what Dan alluded to, but for several reasons of my own that will come out in this discussion. So who am I? I really, you know, am I optimistic? Am I pessimistic? I hope by the end of this session that I will discover my true inner self. But that makes you perfect for taking the it depends position, right? <laughs> That's it. Actually, Dan actually told me the secret. The reason why he escaped to Europe is so you wouldn't punch him in the nose during the rebuttal. <laughs> All right. So uh, wonderful. So we're going on to the next phase, which is the opening statements. And so uh, we just arbitrarily say we're going to start in each case in the same order. Dan Rosen, permanent, John Jin, you know, temporary, and then it depends with Steve. So we're going to follow that same order as we go through. So Dan, opening statement, four minutes. Uh, thank you uh, again, Peter. Well, I mean, Steve Roach um, has given me the right hook to make my opening statement, which was his bullishness of 25 years, um, as he noted, and the fact that that's changed. That bullishness was anchored to the extraordinary growth rates in China, with which the proposition we have before us, have they slowed, right? China's growth was a 10% annual growth story for decade after decade. And then it was still a very robust better than six or 7% growth story up until the eve of the COVID pandemic. And we haven't seen those growth rates in the past two years. And we're here to uh, discuss um, whether they're coming back. Th there's different ways we can, as economists would say, operationalize this question of whether uh, the slowdown is permanent. Probably the best way is to look at uh, what share of the global economy China is by virtue of its growth rate, rate relative to the growth of other countries in the world, of course. And of course, the, the bellwether uh, for global growth is the United States. Uh, the United States' uh, share of global growth has been remarkably stable for the past 13 years, since about 2010, the U.S. has hung in there, despite it all, all the uh, perturbations in the global economy, at around 23 and or 24 percent of global GDP. So now we turn uh, to my, my first argument here. We know that China's slowdown is permanent because it's already happened. And by either looking at China's share of global economic activity, or even more clearly, by looking at China's share of U.S. economic activity, it grew and grew and grew until the eve of the pandemic, and it has clearly peaked and started to slip since that point, at a time when the general narrative was that the rest of the world was in worse economic straits than China was, of course, the one that seemed to come through the pandemic pretty well. But structural realities meant that China, as a share of the size of the United States economy or of the world economy, has been sliding now for three years. The second reason we know that the, the proposition here is permanent, the slowdown, is that we understand why this slowing is happening in China. It's not a mystery to us as economists. There's three long-term components that we use to project how nations are gonna grow. The first is labor inputs. Chinese people are not getting married. They're not having children. The size of the workforce is shrinking dramatically. Uh, that's not gonna turn around inside a few years, really. It's gonna be a multi-decade problem in China to deal with this change in the labor pool. Secondly, capital. China's growth the past 10 years was uh, over unusually high amount of debt uh, creation. 
that cannot be replicated for another decade. It can't even be replicated this year, which is why things are so slow. So that slipped. And third and finally, the China that Steve knew and loved, and I did too, I was very much a bull, right? One of the most powerful factors explaining that was the adaptability of politics. While it wasn't a democracy, it wasn't sclerotic. And it was able to make changes that were necessary in 1978, 84, 92, 98, 2013. Each of these instances I wrote books about, Steve wrote about, Chang Jin wrote about, those things aren't happening anymore. Therefore, sadly, growth as we knew it is not coming back. Thank you. Okay, great. Very good. And uh, so what we're going to do is move on to, uh, to our next uh, debater, uh, who will make his opening statement on temporary, right? Hello again. So um, I'm here to uh, tell you that uh, uh, despite of uh, uh, somewhat low growth rate uh, this year, especially the first half of this year, a big component of the growth slowdown uh, is uh, uh, temporary. You have heard the uh, uh, list of reasons uh, from them for you know why uh, you, uh, you, you know one need one needs to be pessimistic about this. You read about very pessimistic uh, uh, commentaries and news about Chinese economy uh, in English language media uh, all the time uh, these uh, days. I want to first suggest to you that this is not the first time that one is pessimistic about the Chinese economy. In 1989, four Wall Street Journal's centennial uh, issues, Wall Street Journal was founded in uh, 1889, so uh, in 1989, the Wall Street Journal, in its wisdom, thought it would be good for its readers to, uh, to uh, do a forecast of what would be going on uh, in the world. It's called What Future Holds. It's the title of the uh, article. And it, among other things, it made forecasts about future growth stars in the world economy and future growth disasters. And among its uh, Wall Street Journal's list of future growth stars was Zimbabwe. Anything about Zimbabwe has not turned out to be a growth uh, star. A very high on Wall Street Journal's list of future growth disasters was China. And Wall Street Journal gave out very good reason. Wall Street Journal asked many experts, and experts first says China is going to be a growth disaster and provided reasons. The reason sounds extremely sensible. This one party system, terrible politics, with such a uh, economic uh, political structure, it's very unlikely to make sensible economic uh, decisions, look at the economy full of inefficient state-owned firms, and look at geopolitics. In 1989, China was under sanctions by US, uh, Europe, Japan, a bunch of other countries. Geopolitics was extremely unfavorable. Extremely sensible reasons. Had China turned out to be a growth disaster, we will say, yes, of course, we understand the reasons. You know what happened uh, to Chinese economy uh, since uh, then? Not only Chinese economy did not turn out to be a growth disaster, it did not even grow at just average level. It turned out to be uh, not just one of the fastest, it turned out to be the fastest growing large or medium sized uh, uh, economy during that uh, time. So what happens? What are the lessons? Well, uh, you know, what, what the, the lessons are even very smart people by, by our, uh, our uh, ideological uh, framework. Uh, we sometimes are underestimate. We have a label about what Chinese uh, system is like, and we therefore we have a projection about a system with their label how it's supposed to uh, work. We, while we were uh, surprised, uh, what a, uh, you know Wall Street Journal's uh, group of experts were surprised was by how resilient Chinese economy turned out to be, by how pragmatic decision makers turned out to be. They, they were turned out to be um, uh, much more pragmatic than a ideological label would uh, might give you. Most importantly, they were surprised by how entrepreneurial. Uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, business people and people are how much more hardworking, how much more creative, how much more willing to take risk uh, these people uh, turn out to be. Uh, and therefore, when we are pessimistic about China this time around, it's useful to keep that uh, uh, in uh, mind. Why, uh, uh, you know, remaining 30 seconds, let me mention a few reasons why, uh, you know, uh, 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 some important piece of today's uh, slow, uh, growth slowdown uh, was temporary. Let me, first, let me note uh, last week, uh, uh, re very recently, International Monetary Fund, an international organization uh, dominated by the United States, 
but by professional economists rather than by politicians, revised upward the growth rate forecast for China from 5.2% this year to 5.4% uh, this year. But when time is out, I'm going to talk about <laughs> reason uh, some other time, yes. But keep the revision of growth rate in mind. Okay, next. Okay. Um, both of these gentlemen have <clears throat> very good points. Uh, I'm sympathetic to them, uh, but um, I, I think it's important to consider a few things that they haven't mentioned. Uh, one, um, why what, what Dan is missing, I think, is um, in terms of the permanent growth story is what's right in front of us, the US-China conflict. We had a summit yesterday, as you know, uh, and um, I'm not convinced that the summit really moved the needle much, but on the offhand chance that we can resolve the conflict between the US and China, a lot of things will change for China. Number one, we end the trade war in China uh, gets to restart the export machine, um, which is under se severe pressure right now. Number two, we end the, um, uh, the tech war that would allow China to draw on the foreign technologies that it needs for uh, indigenous innovation and productivity enhancement. Uh, and number three, uh, we would put an end to this so-called de-risking, which has led to a diversification of supply chains away from China. So end the conflict, Xi Jinping, uh, and you'll be surprised at the lasting growth dividend. Um, in terms of the negative um, view, my good friend, you haven't mentioned um, the property sector and the potential for uh, a Lehman moment. Um, I am uh, concerned about uh, this global trend toward uh, de-risking and uh, how companies that are so committed to um, the production platform in China for their, their offshore efficiency dividends to the possibility of penetrating this gigantic market that um, they, they may run for cover uh, if the, the, the Western trend toward de-risking uh, becomes contagious. There are signs, early signs, that that may be happening. And finally, um, uh, Dan, Dan mentioned um, the, um, uh, the capital uh, and the, the debt dynamic is being unsustainable. I would take it a little bit further and um, just note that you know, the biggest risk for an economy with an aging population is that it doesn't have the productivity growth to offset it. You can slow down your workforce and, and still grow rapidly provided you have a productivity offset. And with China deriving so much of its growth from low productivity state-owned enterprises, with China crushing um, the um, private sector entrepreneurs that you extol the virtues of, especially in the internet platform sector, the productivity offset is disturbing. Um, the final point I'll say is I am sympathetic, Shan Jing, to your point that when everybody converges on a view and the consensus right now in favor of the negative view is just overwhelming. Dan, you're just in the consensus. And I and and so am I probably right now. Usually you turn out to be wrong. And my time <laughs> is up. <laughs> Three really interesting uh, positions. I'm not one of the debaters, but I want to ask, I want to raise two things for the debaters to contemplate as they're rebutting. One, no one has mentioned the clash between the political needs and the economic needs. And I think that's a factor in China, right? In terms of the power of the Communist Party versus the economy. The other is there is a phrase that says, the bigger the problem, the harder it is to fix. And so I want, I hope that debaters will 
address that issue about, you know, whether that's a factor here. So now we're getting to the fun part. So, uh, and Dan is very glad that he's in a hotel room in Europe because now no one can punch him, right? So we're going to start the rebuttal phase. Because it's three-way, we're going to do it this way. So the first is Dan is going to be the uh, rebuttee, you know, he's going to be the victim. And we're going to have first Shanji and then Steve each take two minutes and say, specific to Dan's points, why do you think that he's all wrong, right? Or partially wrong? So Sanji? I mean, they, so, so most, most importantly uh, is that uh, uh, on top of every, uh, uh, you know, in, in um, uh, opposite of every factors one can think about that will lead to uh, growth slow, uh, permanent growth slowdown, there are um, reasons uh, for, uh, there, there, are, there are some uh, um, uh, counter, potential uh, counter factors. So let me start with the you know, longer term effect with demo, uh, demographics, that, which is a very important challenge. You know? um, but um, you know, Chinese growth rate uh, uh, might slow down because of demographics. It's something that you then didn't uh, uh, emphasize as much. If I were taking his position, that would be the, uh, a very top position I, I, I might uh, uh, mention. But we might uh, um, uh, uh, notice that China is one of the uh, countries that does the uh, heaviest investment in automation uh, in robotics uh, that uh, uh, will help to counter the declining, uh, you know, bot counter uh, bot um, you know, natural persons. And China uh, also uh, is uh, uh, working on improving productivity, something that uh, Stephen uh, emphasizes. And also China currently has ridiculously low uh, retirement age that there's, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, most uh, uh, women re are officially retiring at the age of 50, men at 55. If you are more skilled or senior, you have five more years, but even with five more years, 55 and 60, that's ridiculously early uh, uh, retirement age given the life expectancy. So all of those things uh, that can be uh, uh, reformed and also uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the most productive cities in China are undersized. So the hukou restriction uh, is an area where reform will uh, help to deliver uh, additional productivity uh, increase. Okay, great. Okay. Steve, rebutting Dan's position. How, how much time do I get? You have two minutes. Okay. Um, Dan, you're largely right. <laughs> <laughs> but not completely. Um, <laughs> I think I think your your arguments are weak uh, when it comes to looking at shares of world GDP or U.S. You know you can measure them in dollars, you can measure them in purchasing power parity. You get different answers, but I think your reasons are very compelling. You know the slowing of the working age population, the 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 debt dynamic, uh, and the increasingly uh, unfriendly character of politics in inhibiting growth uh, in China. The one area that I wonder about myself as a student of Japan uh, is that like Japan, China has an incredibly high domestic savings rate. So the the debt that it owes, which is rising very sharply, as you correctly point out, is debt that it owes to itself. It's not uh, vulnerable to um, uh, a loss of, of credit uh, from fickle overseas investors. And as long as China continues to repress domestic consumption, and it's doing a darn good job of doing that, its domestic savings rate will remain high and it will be able uh, to fund uh, its debt. So, um, you know, your, your argument is largely convincing, but I, I would just point out that one um, uh, particularly um, uh, a counter aspect. Actually, Steve, I'm really glad you brought the Japan thing because that's one of the things a lot of people say is, will China become like what happened to Japan, you know, with the, you know, with, with the various things we know. So that's an interest. That's a very interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up. So now. Are you voting for me? 
Uh, I don't get to vote, right? So uh, you'll have to cater to I'll these. I'll take that here. as a vote, though. Right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, the next one is uh, we get to beat on Dang Jing. So Dan, you get to take the uh, first shot. Okay, good. Just trying to get the cadence of the this this extraordinary and and uh, exciting debate format here. I think I've got it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, look, let me. I'm just going to really focus on the one argument at the heart of uh, of Shangjin's uh, um, position. Uh, Shangjin made a very strong case that the argument that China's economy will be a disaster is not a reliable argument and that history has shown that forecasts and predictions of such um, are unreliable. And I will be as generous with that as Steve was with my arguments and say I wholeheartedly agree with it. However, I would point out that is not our debate proposition this evening. Uh, the question is not whether China will collapse or be a disaster or come apart at the seams, although those are all interesting questions, and I'm glad Changjin raised them. We should have another discussion at some other point about that. The question is whether the exceptional, uniquely high level of growth in China for such a large economy over so many decades uh, will return, and whether the slowdown is just a temporary phenomenon. And I don't think that Changjin has really given us any argument as to why we should expect the, um, the, the China rate of growth of the past to come back. Uh, I may be corrected on that when he when he responds to our rebuttals. I'll be curious to see whether um, that is, in fact, what he thinks is happening. Um, but I don't think he believes that six to 10 percent GDP growth for a middle income economy is to be expected the way it was for one of the world's poorest economies starting out in 1978 and the decades thereafter. Thank you. Your, your turn, Steve. The, the, the point that I want to quibble with um, is an important one, and that is this notion that China ultimately will be saved by the ingenuity of its entrepreneurs. That's an old story. That was an important story, uh, I think, in the um, uh, in, in in the late '90s. I remember seeing it firsthand and visiting um, some amazing, rapidly growing, entrepreneurial-driven uh, TVEs, township village enterprises, uh, in eastern China. But um, Xi Jinping has told us he, he is threatened by entrepreneurs. Just ask Jack Ma. <laughs> you know, where is Jack Ma? Tokyo. He's in. He's making Hong Zhou. Well, we'll we'll see. We, you know, it's it's like where's Waldo? Um, three years ago, um, when just about three years ago that that, that <coughs> Jack who has a loose tongue. He got a little bit too loose in a, um, in, in a conference in front of some major senior uh, financial officials. And um, he, he didn't get put away, but he got very, very quiet. And that was followed by a series of stringent regulatory uh, restraints uh, on the internet platform companies, which had been the most entrepreneurial and dynamic um, uh, companies in China, but also on the users of the services coming out of those companies from you know, music and live streaming and my time's up. But the entrepreneurial argument, um, old argument, great argument, you can't make it anymore. And those are good points. In fact, it's also created the problem with the youth, right? Because the high tech jobs are drying up. And so it's creating unemployment with among the youth. So the last victim, I mean, the last body will be uh, Steve. So Dan, you get to take your shot first. He said so many nice things about you. Sure, you don't want to take a flight back here so you could be with us. 
I'm going to cash that check in on some other occasion very soon. Um, <laughs> I, I always insist on a trip to Frank Pepe's Pizza when I come up to Yale to guest lecture classes. And it's been a while since I've had my fix. So Steve should expect to hear from me uh, very soon on that front. And indeed, I mean, in fact, given how much Steve endorsed my position in this debate, I really should just say thank you very much and, and, and good night. Um, however, uh, for the sake of the format, um, I'll offer um, a couple observations on uh, on Steve's argument. As with Shungan, Steve's argument really was um, anchored on a particular point, and that is that a de-escalation with the United States could unlock the return of growth as we know it for China and its pent-up export potential, for example. But extraordinarily, over the past seven years, there has been very little disruption in U.S.-China trade. China's exports to the U.S., despite the Trump tariffs, et cetera, have held up uh, surprisingly well. So I'm not sure, therefore, that there is sort of a, you know, a lost quantum of China's growth um, to be uh, restored in the event of a thaw. By the way, it, it was, all things considered, it was a little bit of a thaw the past 24 hours, which is really nice news. And we should we should think about that, maybe come back to it in the Q&A um, after the uh, after the debate. But then. Uh, also, yeah, uh, I, I wonder up, how the dictator feels about the thought. <laughs> well, you know, it's a technical term, Steve. It's a technical term. And the dictatorship of the proletariat is written into the Constitution. And it's very clear who represents the proletariat in the system. I don't think that's actually a debatable proposition either. But it actually sets up for the final point I want to make in 15 seconds or, or, or fewer, which is that even with a de-escalation of U.S.-China tensions as we've known them in the past, you know, five or 10 years even, there will not be a, an end to de-risking. De and President uh, Biden, Secretary Yellen, Secretary Raimondo, and everyone else has made that abundantly clear that in reopening our dialogue and our interaction with our Chinese counterparts, we are not here to set national security concerns aside. Those are going to remain a sovereign matter for us to manage, just as China manages its own sovereign concerns without regard for what the United States might think about them. And so those de-risking things attached to high tech are not going away, even if we protect more room for two-way direct investment in uh, pedestrian, unstrategic areas, which, of course, as the leader of Rodian Group, I certainly hope um, that we find a way to do that. Thank you. Shanjin, you've got the last get a rebuttal now. So first, I agree with Dan that uh, geopolitics and 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 uh, U U.S. policy, you know, why a change of this could be helpful to uh, uh, Chinese uh, economy. Even without changing this, it hasn't made as big a difference uh, as one might uh, uh, you know one might uh, think. This partly supports my argument that Chinese economy turned out to be more resilient than perhaps a, a typical media description. And suggest partly because uh, you know China's own policies. So the, what, what the U.S. Uh, uh, you know sanctions and, and, and export control do is less on the overall gro uh, growth rate, but on but more on the composition of sectors. Which sectors get to grow faster, and which sectors get to grow uh, relatively um, uh, relatively less uh, fast. Uh, in those sectors that face direct uh, uh, restrictions from U.S. Uh, policy. You know, uh, China for sure uh, is using its own industrial policy, trying to counter that. Uh, it, it won't uh, necessarily succeed 100%, but it will uh, uh, help to mitigate uh, some of the effects. But in outside those um, uh, those uh, sectors, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, in, you know, China remains to be the world's most uh, uh, important manufacturing uh, manufacturing uh, center uh, center. Many manufacturing uh, uh, firms, electric vehicles, the one obvious example are doing uh, extremely well, both domestically uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, internationally, uh, uh, and, but, but not just manufacturing uh, sectors, you know, uh, uh, not just uh, those uh, EV, uh, EV uh, uh, sectors. For example, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft is doing brisk business uh, uh, in China. Microsoft is, is investing heavily in its uh, uh, R&D center uh, in uh, China, uh, working towards more uh, knowledge-intensive uh, products uh, and services. So part of the negative uh, uh, 
uh, news one reads about is about firms reallocating out of China into other lower labor cost uh, uh, economy because Chinese labor cost has been uh, 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 rising. But the co correspondingly, the knowledge intensive uh, part of the economy uh, is uh, expanding uh, fast. Okay, wonderful. So we managed to get through the rebuttal phase. And before we go into closing uh, arguments, I just want to remind you that for the Q&A, uh, those people who are in person, you just raise your hand and identify yourself. And Cindy has the responsibility of choosing who gets to be uh, asked a question. Uh, the, but those of you who are online, you please use the Q&A function and feel free to you know, type in your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait to the end. And Cindy will, uh, will make sure we have sort of a fair division between in-person and, uh, and online. So now we are getting to the closing arguments. So this is the opportunity for our three fabulous debaters to persuade you of their point of view. And I, we're gonna do it in the same order. So it'll be Dan first, then Shanji, and then uh, Chanjin, and then Steve. And each of them will have four minutes uh, or less if they wish, right? Uh, to make their closing last shot at closing arguments. So Dan, you're, you're first. Thank you. Um, once again, this has really been an awesome discussion. I'm so sad I'm not there in the room to carry it into the evening as well. Um, but look, uh, here is, um, there's lots of debatable propositions that we've uh, brought to the conversation tonight. Whether the slowdown in growth in China as we knew it is permanent or not is just not one of them. It is permanent and that's natural and that shouldn't really surprise us. And it's not even bad news for Beijing. It's a function of how far they've come. In 1978, after a terrible pe policy period of immiseration and you know, really the, the tearing apart of the Chinese economy and autarky and cutting off from the world, in current dollar terms, uh, the average per capita income of Chinese men, women, and children was about $300 a year. Uh, to the best we can tell. That was one quarter the per capita in 1978 of Nicaragua, which was a very poor country in that year. So once people are so impoverished in a country that has lots of hard work, lots of skills, lots of potential, lots of good officials, all you really need to do in order to deliver three or four decades of extraordinary growth is stop making them do the wrong things economically. Stop telling people, farmers, they can't decide what makes sense to plant sense to plant in their own backyard. Stop telling them they have to melt down their walks and cooking tools to make slab steel because that's a the party's aspiration to be a steel giant, these sorts of things. And indeed, that's what China did. It stopped telling everybody what to do about things they didn't understand and let people make decisions. Hua Chao Chinese, many of you in the room were involved in the story over the past half century, bringing skills, bringing capital, bringing opportunities to export and learn back to their homeland of China. And that stoked a tremendous amount of economic growth. So much so that by the 2010s, China had truly arrived at middle income status in the world economy, a feat that despite its two or more millennia of history, China had never done. Improving living standards, not just for a handful of urbanites, but really throughout the country in rural areas, not nearly as much as in urban, but everywhere. It's precisely because China has arrived at middle income status that history, universal history tells us that at the period of unusually high growth, that was simply a result of starting so poor is over. We call this regression to the mean. It's been talked about. Larry Summers 10 years ago wrote this up. Like, so we 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 mustn't diagnose this entirely as a fail, a Chinese disappointment in the economic story. There's an aspect of that this year. They can be doing better. And Zhang Jin and Steve and I feel strongly about this. Current performance is not optimal. And that little bit of difference matters immensely. And the lack of productivity today because of the intrusion on the private sector, et cetera, that will be catastrophic for China in the decades ahead. But 
we have to reset what we think great news and a great outcome is. It's not five or six percent anymore, as much as the party would like that target to be the one we think about. It's something well under that. And that's a permanent new reality. It's not bad news. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, important good choices uh, to be made to get it to what the maximum might be, which may be 4%, might be 35 but it's not the Chinese growth of yore. Thank you so much. Chang Jing. Okay, so I'm not here to argue that Chinese economy will go back to 10% growth rate. No one in his or her right mind in the world uh, will uh, argue that. Instead, we're talking about if a declining growth rate from five, six, uh, some percent before pandemic to something like a three percent uh, last year and very weak growth uh, recovery uh, the first half of this year, whether that has a uh, temporary component or not. I'm arguing there's a temporary component that in fact Ch uh, Chinese uh, growth rate will recover from uh, that and not just to back to four percent that Dan just said. And I think the, in fact will go to Five percent and five percent is slightly more than that. Indeed, the International Monetary Fund uh, has revised uh, upward its growth project projection to five point four percent. As I said, uh, World Bank, another institution that's always dominated by by uh, United States, the president of World Bank has always been American, uh, was projecting is projecting a five point six percent growth rate. I think they go. I don't need. We don't need to have that. Uh, uh, kind of growth rate, but five five some percent growth rate, I think, uh, is the one we can uh, we can uh, 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 project. And the reason the reason why we uh, in, the, in the very recent growth rate, uh, uh, the low growth rate reflects a temporary component for for a few reasons. One is global demand is very uh, very weak. That um, not just China had the temporary uh, growth uh, slowdown. Vietnam. You know, a growth starts uh, in many uh, ways, growing only four point some percent uh, uh, this year. Mexico, that should normally benefit from uh, uh, geopolitical uh, tensions, not doing very uh, well. That reflects um, behind this uh, uh, all those uh, economic performance a common global factor, relatively weak uh, global uh, demand. And then the second factor is uh, you know the high uh, and rising U.S. interest rates provides. But first, it caused a global retrenchment of capital away from emerging markets that contributes to weaker than normal uh, growth performance uh, of those uh, countries. All of those factors will uh, will uh, uh, change. That they are uh, clearly temporary uh, uh, factors, uh, and and also the high U.S. interest rate also causes a temporary carry trade uh, phenomenon. The capital get, even portfolio capital get withdrawn from uh, China and other emerging markets. Those surely will be reversed, uh, history uh, tells us uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 well. Then you might ask, you know, where, are, where are the growth uh, uh, spots in China? Where do you find the uh, growth? Well, I, I, I mentioned that China remains to be the world's uh, uh, premier uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, center. General Motors, Teslas can count on being able to sell more vehicles in China this year, next year, and in the near future, then not just in the US, but all North America countries combined. Uh, and, um, um, and Chinese consumption growth uh, at the 5% uh, a year um, on, on average will give you the fastest growth uh, of consumption dollar term uh, compared to any other country, including US, uh, including um, uh, India. Since 2001, China has been the largest single country contributor to global GDP growth and to global consumption growth. Any given country's uh, contribution to global GDP growth is a product of the country's share in the world economy and its growth rate. So Chinese contribution is bigger than US because it's been growing twice as fast as the US. Chinese contribution to the global uh, growth is fast bigger than India because Chinese economy is about five times the size of India. So in spite of India's slightly higher growth rate, the part of the two is smaller. Uh, as far as I can see in the, in the, in the near, uh, near future, uh, China will remain the, the, the largest uh, single country contributor to global consumption growth and global GDP growth. That's the thing I want you to keep in mind. And now, Steve, I know you always like to have the last word, and so we're going to give you the last word. <laughs> Your closing statement, four minutes. All right. Um, I'm the, the guy on the fence, so I've got to say a little something about both of our two extreme views here. Uh, Shanjin, I, I, I like you a lot. Um, <laughs> 
I thought yeah. you liked Dan a lot. <laughs> I haven't gotten to Dan yet. Um, but I, I just don't buy the idea that you can use this rubber band theory to predict what's going to happen to China in the future. The rubber band theory, for those of you who don't get it, is imagine I'm holding a giant rubber band, I pull it down, and then I let go of it and it snaps back. China, to, to have that inherent resilience, it's got to have more dynamism uh, going forward than it has right now. Uh, the important point that Dan made way back uh, at the beginning of this uh, debate was that the political shackles that have been put on China by its esteemed leader uh, has really uh, eaten away at this dynamism. So the rubber band, which has been stretched a lot uh, in recent years, has lost its elasticity. And I'm not convinced that um, you know uh, the party and the leadership uh, uh, recognizes this. With respect um, to my good friend, um, Dan Rosen, he, um, I think he, he overstepped in saying that slow growth is not a big deal uh, for a nation that has come as far as uh, China has uh, since the early 1980s. Xi Jinping has made a promise a solemn promise to the Chinese people, uh, an aspirational promise to deliver on what he called beginning in late uh, 2012, the Chinese dream uh, to bring um, China into the, the, the lofty realm of being a, a major power um, and more than just a moderately well-off society. He promised uh, prosperity uh, that has been so elusive for all of China for most of its long history. Under a slow growth trajectory, and here I would define slow growth as more like a Japanese stagnation outcome, something like one to 2%, he's not gonna hit the target. Uh, and the, the, uh, uh, the Chinese people will be disappointed, whether or not they can express that disappointment uh, uh, openly, or they just sort of lie flat, as many appear to be doing right now, that remains to be seen. But we talk about the power of the party, the power of a, a president for life. That requires the, um, the leadership to deliver on a growth trajectory uh, that could well be um, beyond their reach if they don't begin to uh, focus on bringing that elasticity, that dynamism uh, back into China. Wonderful, wonderful. So I, uh, first of all, everyone, I hope you all appreciate our, our, our debaters here. Before, before we move to the next phase, I, I, I do want to say the following, which is this is not the first time that the Committee 100 had a debate. In 2019, April, we had a debate, and the question was, is it inevitable that the Chinese economy will be bigger than the US economy? I won't tell you what the result was. I will tell you that Dan Rosen was one of the debaters, right, Dan? Right? That's why he's in Paris today. That's why he's in Paris. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it was a lively debate, very interesting arguments. You know, some of the issues are overlap with with what, but it was very, very interesting then to see now, four years later, what is developed versus the arguments. And the one thing I can say is that regardless of the arguments that these debaters are make, with the passage of time, the answer will be revealed, right? And so challenge all of us to remember these arguments, but whether it's four years or five years from now, think back and say, what actually then happened and what, you know, what, what actually occurred. So our next step is our exciting part, which is one, we're gonna find out what you think now, and then we're gonna do a Q and A, right? So the first question is now that you've heard all these wonderful arguments, I want, we want you to tell us 
what you think the answer is your position with regard to depends temporarily or permanent. Well, there's a lot of dynamic going in here. We have either either people are slow or there are a lot of people changing their minds, right? <laughs> it could be either one, right? At some point it'll stop moving, right? They're still voting. No, They're not. still voting, right? Yeah. Not everyone is moving, voting. Do we have a few hundred to say? Oh, yeah, we have, yeah, we have a lot of people here. It's, it's start moving up. All right, we got to close the polls. It's over. Okay. So what were the, what were the percentages from the first one? So uh, initially, we have 15% at permanently, temporarily at 50%, and 35% at it depends. So, so there is a shift before we were at 50% at temporary, and now... We have nearly 40% that it depends. So that's a bit of a change. And permanently, uh, that's a big jump before at 15%. And now we're at 33%. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So there was there was a shift, right? Mm -hmm. People went for more temporary to permanent or it depends. So it's interesting. So this audience, you know, had to rethink the issue. Now, this is important, of course, but the really important one is the next vote, right? So now the next vote, and all now our contestants here are very nervous about it, which is who do you think was your favorite debater independent of your position? Here we go. All right. Oh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> Well, this is this is like the Miss America contest or Olympics, whatever. Here we go. Steve, yours is going like up and down like crazy, right? Story of my life. <laughs> Kenny, did you vote? <laughs> okay, it's interesting, right? And by the way, I can say that in 2019, because we did the same voting, although we didn't have the advantage of advanced technology, everybody had to put down. Uh, it was interesting to see whether there was a difference between your view of the issue versus your view of the debate. Forty-four is an unlucky number. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness it changed. Somebody please vote for one of my uh, debating opponents, please. Thank you. My, my flight back is going to be canceled tomorrow, all of a sudden. <laughs> so you have voted. And I feel like this is like America's Got Talent or something like that. So the viewers have voted. And the winner is Dan Rosen. Now, we presented ourselves. And it's very interesting because that wasn't necessarily the highest percent into your view on the position. So, so, so Dan, congratulations. We have a logistical problem, which is we have a, a gift for you as the, as the winner, but you're too far away. So we're going to have to give it to you when you come back. <laughs> no, yeah, give it, give it to the other guys who showed have up. Things for the, for, for the, I mean, Dan's going to have a nice meal in Paris tonight. Yeah. yeah so, it's very interesting, but uh, it, it, you know, it does say this is a very important issue, and I'm glad that this, there's some interesting arguments, and we have some great, great you know, debaters here, and I hope that you ended up feeling that you know more about the issue than, than when you first arrived. So now we're going to go into the Q&A. We did promise, uh, where is Zoe Liu? Over there? Okay. We, who who won this? Well, I'll be fair. Zolu is is at the is a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and there was a possibility that one of the debaters couldn't come through, so she was the understudy, sort of like in Broadway. So she memorized the entire play, she prepared and everything, but now she didn't get to sing. So we're <laughs> going to give her the chance to either make the first 
question or the first comment? Sure, and it's truly a pleasure to be here and uh, also be the uh, understudy for uh, Professor Stephen Roach. He's somebody who I studied, um, you know, th although I never get the chance to take classes with you, but uh, you know, I read a lot of his, his, his research. And also when I wor was working on my doctoral th thesis, trying to study China's foreign exchange reserves and the sovereign wealth fund, I realized that uh, Professor Shang Jingwei has written so much. Then Dan would be the person like, what is going on in China? Why the bond market is just flipping? And what what is the environmental issue? Like everything that I do not understand, I know that I can always go to Dan and ask him. It doesn't matter what how, what the question is. He always give me the concrete explanation. So it's, you know, the, the, for me personally, this is, I, I learned a lot. And uh, you know, I, I do have uh, have questions in, in, in terms of you know the, the different view. And first of all, you know, this is absolutely fantastic a three view three way debate. Um, and by the way, if it's a difficult question uh, directed to Steve, it's yes, an easy question actually. directed to Dan. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm you, glad you, know, you finally figured. <laughs> You know the the differences today actually just re, re, reminded me of something that I, um, I I explained to some of our CFR members uh, in terms of how I read the Chinese economy. Um, you know I, I like to go to the mat the same as Dan likes to paint. Uh, you know like how do I understand the Chinese economy? I, before Xi Jinping came into power, I thought especially during the high growth years, I think the Chinese economy is like a Monet. You know it's the impressionist, it's impressive looking from afar, but up close it's a jumbled mat mess, right? And seeing in the in the past five years, I think is probably Jackson Pollock is more like a, a jumbled mess from afar and the jumbled mess from up close. So, you know, in this particular context, you know, like we do read uh, fantastic scholars like um, Adam Posen, you know, he explained this whole phenomenon as a China having the long economic COVID. And I, I'm just curious, the, the three of you and, and you know, uh, Mr. Yang, yours as well, to what extent do you think that COVID pandemic as well as President Xi Jinping's handling of the situation from zero COVID to the crackdown of property market, a lot of these policies Policy, policy missteps during COVID, as well as COVID itself. To what extent this is a paradigm shift? Thank you. Okay. So the question is, COVID, what impact did it, ha did it have? And to direct it to any of you, so whoever wants to answer. Look, I, I'll just be brief. I think, you know, I, I've known Adam Posen for years. He has thoughtful things to say about Japan, but that's possibly the most unthoughtful thing I've heard or seen written about China in a reputable publication like Foreign Affairs. Um, so I, I don't buy the idea that you can summarize the growth problems from China as a sort of a long COVID. It's far more complex than that. I, I would agree. I, I would just, let me just pile on there. I think uh, all of the structural challenges China is dealing with today predate the pandemic and it's unhelpful. Uh, in China and around the world to direct people's attention to COVID-related scarring and things, which are a big deal and, and affected cyclical dynamics, but don't really have very much to do with the underlying problems which uh, are bedeviling uh, the China and the, and the people of China that will, that will pay the consequences, yeah. So we'll turn to Cindy, who's going to orchestrate the Q&A from online and in person. Okay, so just ahead of time, um, we have a bunch of questions online and I see so many hands. So I apologize in advance, we're not gonna get to all of them. One question online is um, relating to direct foreign investment. So they say, I uh, have not heard from the panelists about the role of foreign uh, direct foreign investment to China's development and the fact that it went negative in Q3 of this year. Does anybody have anything to comment? Dan uh, is the high priest of FDI. <laughs> Look, uh, just very, very briefly. Yeah, indeed. For the In the third quarter of 2023, in the, for the first time in modern Chinese statistical history of tracking foreign direct investment, there was net disinvestment by the multinational investing community of about $11 billion in the quarter. That's not a huge amount of money in the context of investment in China, but as a change from the previous pattern, it is extraordinary. And I, I would, you know, just sort of contextualize it by saying that on January 1st, 2023, all of the CEOs and business leaders I spoke to expected that by the end of the year, 
they would probably be back to business as usual or growth as we knew it in China. And today, zero of them, 0% of them think that business as usual came back. And most of them are doubtful, precisely what we're debating here tonight, that it's just a matter of hanging in there a little longer. And so in some sectors, folks are going to stick around forever. In others, that's fine. The ship has sailed. Time to go to Vietnam if you're doing textiles, let's say. But in the aggregate, what you're seeing here is a, is a whole phase change in the relationship of direct investment to, to the Chinese economy. It's a very fascinating uh, question. Thank you for asking it. Can I add a few points to this? So, you know, part of the uh, FDI slowdown clearly reflects uh, 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 sentiments, but but not entirely. Uh, the FDI, because this, this is a net FDI, so it's it's a, it's a difference between inward FDI and outbound FDI. So one of the things many firms, including Chinese firms, are doing are uh, greatly increase their outbound uh, FDI. So when you when the outbound FDI goes up, inward FDI minus outbound FDI can become smaller or turn negative. That's one important uh, piece of it. The second uh, piece of it is because the difference in interest uh, interest rate, US interest rate is so much higher than China and, and directions is uh, even wider uh, a wider wedge. That creates incentive to do carry trade. That, uh, you know, and, and you want to do carry trade legally, uh, given Chinese skeptic and choose. So he is an uh, expert on foreign exchange reserve and, and, and capital controls. So, so one way to do this is to use FDI as a channel. So you can do uh, you know, portfolio flow pretending to be FDI and to get out to do the carry trade. And they will create the, the, uh, the, uh, 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 you know, the illusion of uh, uh, outbound uh, uh, FDI. So support for this is, you know, this, I happen to have a survey of uh, uh, done by International Marketing Association of Asia, which is a you know, multinational uh, con uh, consulting firm. They ask firms, you know, what do you think of, what's your uh, China operation profit compared to the others? 59% of, uh, uh, this is done in October, so uh, uh, very recently, the Q beginning of the Q4, 59% of the uh, international firms says uh, their China operation is more profitable than their home country uh, this year. 68% says China, Operations more profitable or as profitable as uh, uh, most of the countries in the uh, in the world. So that, so that suggests that uh, 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 supporting the idea is more like every multinational firm think this is you, you want to exit China and don't don't go back. Uh, I will spend one comment since my firm were we work with companies all over the world and a lot of Western ones. The, that that may be true about profits and maybe because they're depressed in Europe or whatever. But the sentiment about making investments the, 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 is, is very negative. I think a lot of people just say there's too much uncertainty. And so a lot of people are pulling back. The people who already have big investments like BASF and so forth, they can't retreat. You know, they've already put billions of dollars in. So I think this confidence level, I think, is going to be a, a, a real problem. I first of all, uh, thank you so much for sharing these uh, great insights uh, with us. Uh, this is one of the best. Uh, debate I've never been to. Uh, it's really amazing. Uh, my name is Fred Horn. I'm uh, currently working in the private wealth management sector. Um, uh, however, I was uh, in, in the system in China. Actually, uh, I work uh, uh, you know, with Bank of China, or Ministry of, uh, of State Science and Technology. You know, I, I, I have my observations, which I want to share with uh, the group here. And also, I'd like to hear your thoughts. The first observation is the Chinese family dynamic. Uh, we know in the last 30 years, China has one child family. Talking about productivity and the work ethics, and my observation is that's declining uh, because all the parents and grand grandparents, and they have accumulated some wealth for their one, one child. And now in this transfer of wealth, what I noticed that work you know, their responsibility, accountability, and all the work ethics are not comparable to our generation. Okay, that's number one observation. Number two is the uh, Asian population. I know this is a global issue, but again, because of Chinese family dynamic, I think that's going to come very fast and dramatic. And that's another thing. I was wondering how this is going to affect China's economy. The third is AI, which in my opinion is, is universal, but we don't know what kind of impact uh, to Chinese economy. Thank you very much, okay. appreciate it. So you're asking for 
you made some points, but you're asking the debaters how they react to those points, right? Any reaction? Yeah, let me just be Go quick, ahead. just on the aging. I focused on this forever. With a, an aging population, uh, the, the big policy mistake that continues to be made in China right now is underinvesting in the social safety net. Uh, and that's uh, pensions and healthcare. Uh, China focuses on uh, the enrollment dimension of uh, uh, safety net participation and not on the benefit side. So lacking in uh, the benefits that um, make um, the future look secure for Chinese families, they tend to save more than spend more. And so the, the, as a result, the consumption share of the Chinese economy is stuck below 40%. It'll never get above it if China doesn't change uh, and respond to the social safety net pressures that an aging society, a rapidly aging society needs. In answering this question, it's useful to, to uh, uh, explain, in case you do not know, our debate positions are assigned to us, not necessarily reflect our views. So in fact, your question is very important because uh, they are clearly very important reasons for why the growth rates are trending, uh, trending uh, down. Uh, demographic challenge is very important one. So working age cohort, so let's say defined from age 15 to uh, 60, since about uh, four or five years ago, been growing at a negative rate. By itself, nothing else uh, changes. By itself, this will imply progressively lower growth rate. So there will be a very strong argument for why growth rate can, is coming down. On top of it, uh, it, uh, another very strong reason uh, that uh, Dan um, uh, mentioned, of course, is, is that precisely as a country gets uh, uh, richer, slow uh, growth ratio slow down because the relative importance of innovation relative to catch up uh, uh, rises and it's intrinsically harder to do, to innovate uh, than to uh, uh, catch up. So both reasons are very extremely strong reasons for why uh, growth rate naturally should uh, come down um, permanently. However, the uh, it does not mean that the, you know growth rate mechanically will go go towards you know two percent rate or three percent rate that uh, that then says so on the aging uh, issue. There are things country uh, uh, can do. So for example, for example, uh, invest more in uh, in robotics and a uh, AI related technology to to make up for the relative shortage of, of bodies is one. Uh, I mentioned postponing retirement age, reforming the retirement age is another. Reforming immigration policy uh, is the third. So, so China, um, relative to US, for example, as of now, is very close to immigration. But you can imagine a potentially sensible temporary work visa program will be another way to counter the demographic uh, um, uh, challenge. None is easy. Uh, not, none of them is easy for political, technological reasons, but many can be potentially productively uh, uh, exploited. Right? Yeah, okay. Dan, any comment on any of the three points made? Okay, great. So the next question is online and it's actually directly linked to your response just now. Um, you talked about how reform and retirement uh, system and also possibly reform and immigration policy may change the uh, economy. One additional aspect that uh, this particular person was curious about is whether trade or alliance with the Middle East will accelerate the growth of the Chinese economy. Trade alliance? Uh, yeah, trade or alliance with the Middle East. Alliance. Well, let me take a stab at that, actually, since nobody's jumping at it. I mean, I would just say that <laughs> the, um, look, so much of the good stuff that happened in China the past four or five decades was spillovers from the interaction with the most innovative economies in the world and most innovative people, uh, entrepreneurs, as we were discussing, watch out Chinese from around the region and best companies in the world from advanced economies, United States, Japan, Korea, Europe, et cetera. There are benefits of having deeper, closer relationship with the fossil fuel producing regions of the world like the Middle East and Russia, but the kind of spillovers to a high quality, higher income growth economy that China wants to be are not among them. Their, their Middle East cannot replace the role of American consumers, European consumers in helping provide a, a driver of Chinese growth, cannot replace the kind of high technology benefits from having a trusted and deepening relationship with the firms of Silicon Valley 
um, or the automakers of uh, of Swabia in Germany, etc. Uh, and so uh, I have, I think there's great, I have great trepidation in the idea that I hear nowadays that it's okay because Middle East is going to backfill opportunities uh, of, arise from withdrawal of G7 economies from deciding to go long China. Anyway, I hear this frequently these days, and I think it's it's really quite problematic, uh, an idea. Yeah, and I, and I agree with Dan, just because when you think about what China can get from the Middle East, it's a very short list, right? So it's not the kind of thing that will create ex large amounts of export products and so forth. I also agree. Mostly they can get ulcers, Peter. Joining, I also agree, but joining APEC and close association with ASEAN countries will be much more meaningful yes, than, right. than Middle East. Yeah. Dan's answer is so good. That's why he won the prize. <laughs> so let's just move on if there's another We're question. We're going to move on to this lady over here. Um, if we could just keep the questions short so that we have more. I'll be very quick. Hi, I'm Serena. I, my mentor is here, mentor is there, uh, member of Committee 100 Next Generation Program. And I believe I've booked all three of you on my news programs before at CCTV, Fox. Dan, especially at Fox, I remember. Yes, I've worked at CCTV, CBS, and Fox, Fox Business. Um, my question actually first is, I noticed that was missing in the debate points about the youth uh, unemployment rate in China. I think when we look at a country, especially the future we're forecasting, trying to forecast, we look at the next generation. And I noticed a number is pretty astonishing, 30% youth unemployment rate. Um, potentially the real number is higher. So any comment on that? Yeah, it's, it's a big, big issue. And it goes back to the, the, the point I made metaphorically, and that is the dynamism, the elasticity of the Chinese economy has been driven by a private sector uh, linked very closely to entrepreneurial startups in the internet platform area. And the, the government is uh, constricting, constraining, inhibiting that growth, and that's taking a disproportionate uh, blow on uh, the younger people who have felt that this is their uh, their profession of choice. And I think that's going to be a lasting and serious problem uh, going forward, no matter how the government is trying to spin the idea that, you know, we're done squeezing the private sector. I don't buy that. Yeah, and by the way, the sad part is, how could you have a lot of unemployment and yet you have a shortage of labor and it's fairly straightforward, which is the government encouraged all these young people to go to college and get educated, but you don't go to college and educate to make iPhones, right? And so what happened is they created all this expectation and yet the jobs that now are available are the wrong jobs for them. So you have this sad situation where even though there's a shortage of labor, the jobs that these young people want to have are, are declining. And that's a sad combination. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry. We do have a hard stop. There were so many good hands. Um, and if people want to submit their questions to us, we can try to maybe uh, reach out to our yeah. experts and we'll provide answer. some um, Dan, a summary. Dan will answer. Dan will answer. On send, his flight back. Send them to what? Events? What, what email should you send them? Uh, events at committee100.org. So if you have questions, and particularly if you want to compliment the debaters, send them and we'll forward the compliments. If you need Dan's private. <laughs> <laughs> But the last word is, I want, first of all, I really want to thank our three debaters and please join me in thanking them. But also I want to thank all of you. We had some lively discussions, great questions, and I encourage you to get very involved with Committee 100's activities. We're very active in so many different areas and we want to really see a lot of you at our events, but also those of you who want to you know, join us in the kinds of things we want to do we really would love to see you. So thank you very much all.